Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here for Joy Rider TV, coming live from the Wild Wind workshop. Um, very exciting times here at Wild Wind, as ever, with more champagne conditions on a daily basis at this time. Um, yeah, I've got a very exciting video coming up just tomorrow, um, which is the first time I've mounted the 360 camera, the GoPro Max, on the helmet and um, standing at the back of the 16 with the 360 camera on the helmet, the pictures were absolutely incredible. Uh, you can get a little sneak preview of those pictures if you want. Um, I just put a, a, a still from that on Instagram. So uh, you could check that out on Instagram if you want a little sneak preview of how that is going to look. But just checking in with who's checking in already. We've got Greg on board. Um, and uh, Greg straight in with a juicy question. So here we go. What's Greg got for us? Is there a big difference in how you steer the boat between the Hobie 14 up to the Tiger and the Tornado? Hmm. It's quite an interesting question. Um, the one of the main differences is the Tiger and the Tornado are very much absolute beasts when it comes to going upwind and downwind specifically. So if we're sailing up towards the wind, then what we generally would do if it's trapezing conditions is um, if it's trapezing conditions and not absolutely full power, what I would do anyway is I would have my crew playing the downhaul. So as we sail into a gust, sorry, just to put a bit of context here, as we come into a gust, um, then rather than sheeting out the main or turning up into the wind, what I would do is have the crew pull the downhaul on, which is, as we've said before, it's flattening the sail, it's moving the centre of effort down and forwards, which is making the sail drive us forwards better. So as we go into the gust, pulling on the downhaul, and then if the gust is so much that having... Um, pulled the downhaul, the hull is still going up in the air. If we can then control the boat by steering into the wind a little bit uh, without losing any speed and stopping the hull from going any higher, then that is enough. But if to stop the hull from going any higher, we're going to lose speed by steering, uh, that's the time when we're also going to ease an armful of main sheet. So, down into the gust, downhaul comes on. If the hull stops lifting, then that's enough. But if it keeps lifting, we'll head up a little bit into the wind. If it keeps lifting more, then we'll ease a bit of sheet. Whereas on something like a Hobie 16, what we do is we would already have the downhaul set because you're not really going to be playing the downhaul from the trapeze on the 16 unless you've got some top secret um, system on there. Um, instead, as you go into the gust, just heading up slightly to control the power. And if to control the power, you have to head up so much that you're going to lose speed, then um, we are going to ease a bit of sheet as well. If we're constantly having to ease sheet, then we'll also ease a bit of traveller so that then we can get that um, tension in the main sheet. So that is one big difference on the upwind. On the downwind, of course, the biggest difference is with the Tornado and the Tiger, we're going to be sailing with a spinnaker. So that is a significant difference. But if you were sailing a 16 with a spinnaker, it wouldn't actually be very different at all, apart from how kind of nervous the boat feels like on a 16 with a spinnaker because the boat is quite lightweight, quite short as well, low volume hulls. It's going to be very jumpy on the downwind with the spinnaker up. 
Whereas with the Tornado, which is a much bigger boat, it's much more steady. You really can lock it in at an angle. So that is one big difference between them as well is because of the width. Uh, with the wider boats, it's much easier to control the angle at which you're lifting the hull. Whereas with the narrower boats, it's much more difficult to control that angle. So that's another big difference. But for me, if I'm just out in Vasiliki Bay doing some burning laps, there is not much different. I do, I've been actually told it's the wrong thing to do, but I do sail the Tornado and the Tiger and the C2. If I'm not putting the kite up, I'll put the dagger boards up halfway and sail it like a 16. And that works, except it's much more hard work because the sheet loads a lot more and the boat doesn't want to go as fast as the 16 on those two sail reaches. So there you go, Greg. There's a little insight. Um, not a massive difference, but certainly um, with the more modern designs, some kind of more sophisticated means of controlling the power rather than just steering and sheeting. There we go. All right. Just uh, we've got bottles back in at to totaljoyrider.com like this one, but with much better designs. Mm, very nice. At this time, actually, I'd just like to thank everybody again who's been supporting the channel and supporting my um, campaign to go to the worlds. We've almost reached the target already, which is absolutely incredible. So it was just two weeks ago in the Q&A that I first mentioned that I was going and somebody mentioned why not set up a crowdfunding thing, did it. And you guys are very good. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. All right. So we've got Willis on board. Willis is early this time. I have new rudder springs. I'm having trouble installing them from the top. Any tips or tricks to get them in and get the sister screw sister screw um into the cams all right let's just grab something all right i'm just grabbing something i haven't left all right so i've grabbed a rudder stock and what else are we grabbing we're grabbing have we got springs in here all right i'm oh yes found one okay i am coming back i'm just uh, shopping for parts all right so here we've got um a rudder stock uh for a hobie 16 it's no different to the hobie 18 or tiger or 17 except on those rudder stocks they're actually a lot easier to work on because this part is open rather than closed. So with the spring, it is difficult. Um, in fact, I always load the parts for the rudder system from inside, from the bottom. So what I would generally do first is take the plunger. That is this piece. And that's what the cam sits on top of. And just make sure that in here where the, sorry, uh, how can we see this? In here where the plunger is going to sit, there is actually enough space for the plunger to move. Can we see that? To move up and down. Now this one's a little bit tight. Oh, it's actually this one's pretty good. But if it's really tight in there, what I would actually do is take some sandpaper or a file and just sand down opposing sides slightly, just flatten them off slightly. And that will allow that to go up and down much easier and more smoothly. Having that plunger able to go up and down smoothly, is going to make a big difference to how well your rudder system is going to work. Uh, what I would then do is take take the screwdriver and uh, just put the spring on the end of the screwdriver like that 
and then slot him up here thus okay and then comes the really tricky bit and that is getting the screw in um i would put plenty of grease on here as well because what you don't want ever is this to seize up in the thread so i would get that onto the end of the screwdriver like that just trying to make sure and just very steady going in And then once you've got a couple of turns on there, then you're, you've made it, you're home. Very good. And then after that, I would then put the cam in. All right, I'm getting the impression I'm perhaps even talking about something that Willis isn't asking. I'm just going to read Willis's later follow-up. The sister screw is instead of the original rivets. Yes, that's what they're originally called. Oh, and Willis's adjuster screw is seized. Ooh. Oh, dear. All right. Um, Yeah, so that is how I would load that anyway and make sure it's all very well greased up. Now, what Willis is saying is this screw here, which is um, in Europe, they call this the Delrin screw because it's made from Delrin type plastic. Um, if that is seized up, then... What I'm I've seen video of this working rather well. What you can do is get a blowtorch, heat up the tip of your screwdriver until it is extremely hot, and then melt the end of the screwdriver into the screw, get it right in there, and then I would then put this in, or perhaps before you put it in put this in a vice or get it gripped somehow and then stick it in, get a spanner on your screwdriver, applying downward pressure and try that. If that doesn't work, we then have to revert to drilling it out, which can take a lot longer and you will need um, quite a long drill bit. That's Ricky Nielsen. Um, yeah, there he is. Fastest man in Vasiliki. That's me. All right. We're talking about um, drilling out screws. All oh, right. Sorry. What's the best way to hydrate yourself in this Greek summer sun? Uh, water. Water. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. That's Rick. Always there with the good questions. Um, yeah. So if you do have to drill that out, you're going to need a long drill bit. And then after you've drilled it out, what I would then do is take a thin chisel, scrape out the rest of the screw that is still in the thread and then take a tap um and re-tap the thread so it's quite an operation so for that reason if any of you haven't given your screws a turn for some time i would recommend trying just give it a turn just one turn and then turn it back if it does turn and then that means you know that it's not going to be seized up um if it is seized up but you're quite happy with how it's working, then I would leave it and only revert to drilling it out when you need to. If it's all working fine, there's no need to do it. Of course, if you are taking your boat apart in the winter and you've got all winter to do a major service, then that would be the time. Okay, I hope that helps, Willis. All right. Oh, we've got, um, we've got Nick, who was here with us last week. Hello, Nick. Uh, great to have you on board. Um, yeah, Nick was just over there last week. Now he's back in Bulgaria. All right, we've got Daniel. Nice to see you live, like always. Thanks for tuning in, Daniel. Nice that you could make it. Hello, Robin. It's Robin, of course, with the 16, with the, uh, what are they called? In Not Insanity Sales, um, Infinity Sales can't remember uh on the hobie 16 in florida very nice too all right we've got richard on board when do you hang up your sails for the winter i think that's more of a a metaphor than an actual question of um i suppose yeah when do you hang up your sails we usually leave the sails um just stacked on shelves rather than hanging them up but 
I think what you're talking about is when are we closing here at Wildwind? And the answer to that is this year we've actually extended our season by a week and we're finishing on the 10th of October this year. The reason that we're finishing at that time is because after that time, the weather really does become a little bit unpredictable. So we want to make sure that when people are coming out to go sailing, they're going to have some good sailing. So that's why we're closing on the 10th. Um, good question there, Richard. All right. Nick says, last time you discussed adjusting the downhaul on the tornado on an upwind course. Can you talk about how you play the main sheet and traveller downwind with the kite up? Do we can do that, Ollie? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yes, we can. All right. So if we, we're talking about main sheet and traveller on the downwind point of sail, spinnaker up, doesn't really matter which type of boat you're on either. This could be for a 16, for a dragoon, for a uh, something like a topaz um, or something, anything with a spinnaker, pretty much the same. So if we start off in mega light wind. So really, when you're just trying to get the boat moving forwards through the water, what we want, am I going to draw something? That is the big question at the moment. No, I don't think I've got any artistic ideas for this one. But um, so in the mega light winds, in fact, yes, we're going to be sailing. We're keeping the wind in the same direction. We'll make quite a big boat. There we go. So if we just look at the position, it's all re related to the position where we're going to be sat on the boat. So the sail is going to be over here and the helm on the boat wants to be sat on the downwind. Um, how shall I draw the person but with a circle? Around here, which means the tiller extension. So this is kind of like we're setting the, um, the traveller more for a mechanical reason rather than for an airflow reason. We're going to set the traveller, if that's the middle there, we're going to set the traveller just out about that much, just a very small amount. And what that means is that the tiller extension isn't going to foul on the main sheet block. There's the tiller extension there. So that's what I would go for with the traveler in mega light winds. So in the mega light winds, we're moving in towards the mast just to try to encourage that windward hull to lift that little bit earlier. And then with the main sheet, a good way of looking at our rough main sheet position is if we were to look at the back of the boat, there's the beam. We could actually talk about the main sheet by what sort of angle it's sitting at. So in light winds, we'd want it at about 45 degrees like that, the main sheet. So we're really putting a lot of slack into the leech of the sail which is really going to help the boat to accelerate when any bits of wind come along. What we will also do is, um, all right, more pictures. We're big on the pictures here. There's the main sail. There's a couple of battens in there. Is going to look at the leech telltales on the main sail. And if at any point we're starting to lose those leech telltales on the mainsail, what those do is they'll show you if the sail is oversheated. So if the sail is too tight, these are going to start to disappear. If it's just the bottom one disappearing, we can live with that. But if it's the second one going, 
then that means we really are quite oversheeted. So in that case, we need to let the main sheet out a bit to make sure that that bad boy is still flying. The reason that we're using leech telltales rather than telltales that you might have in the body of the sail is because on these type of boats, the sail is generally quite tall and these are excellent for quick reference. So all you need to do is glance up the sail, you see it immediately and you're back to looking at where you're going. So, um, yeah, there we go. We're looking at the leech telltales. We've got a rough angle of 45 degrees on the main sheet and the traveller out about that far. What's that? About 15 centimetres. That is the mega light winds. Then as the wind gets stronger, what's going to happen is our position on the boat. So this was all blue for mega light. Then we'll go green for slightly stronger conditions. As the wind increases, we're going to move more outboard and a little bit back. Um, the crew in this situation would be almost directly opposite, perhaps just a little bit further forwards on the other side of the boat. So this is likely to be before you're double trapezing upwind. Um, maybe you're having one person going out onto the trapeze occasionally upwind. So we're talking here about eight knots or so. Um, and then when it gets this windy, we'll then bring the traveller. So sorry, if that was that, that traveller position should be blue. We'll bring the traveller up to the middle. And then we again, rather than using this kind of reference in these conditions, we're definitely going to be watching the leech telltales. And if they're all flying, so we're kind of attacking them from a different angle here. If they are all flying, we're going to sheet it in just until the bottom one starts to hook round the back. And that's where we know we're in the sweet spot for the mainsail position. So this is going to be more kind of upright like that as we get into a bit more wind. As we get into a bit more wind still, so perhaps we've been double trapezing consistently upwind. Um, it's just going to be, Traveller's going to be in the middle all the way now, um, right up until mega strong wind. And just the main sheet is going to be getting progressively tighter as the wind increases. Because not only um, do we need the main sheet in tight uh, for the airflow, we're also using the main sheet. So the main sheet is pulling down here, which is pulling along the back of the sail, which effectively is pulling the top of the mast backwards like that, which is effectively um, working as a backstay. So that's providing a lot of support for the mast. So when the wind is really strong and you've been sailing upwind, double trapezing, downhaul on full, at that time, we're going to be cranking the main sheet in very tight. I would usually do this as the spinnaker's going up. I would usually be cranking the main sheet in at that time to make sure it is tight enough once the spinnaker's pulling, because otherwise what can happen is this, of course, we've got our, sorry, wrong colour. We've got our shrouds and forestay, which are holding, sorry, bad angle there, but they're holding the mast up to this point. But the mast above this point is totally unsupported, which is why we need to support the top of the mast. One of the worst things you can do, in fact, if you want to deliberately snap your mast when you're sailing with the spinnaker up in high winds, Sail very hard, spinnaker up and dig the bow in hard. And as soon as you dig the bow in, let the main sheet off and then you will snap the mast. So that's how you snap the mast. So don't let the main sheet off if you dig the bow in. The only time when it's windy that you would want to let the main sheet off is if you sail into a big hole where there's less wind. 
So there we go. I think that is pretty much the whole story of Traveller and main sheet settings. Just one other thing with the Traveller is if for some reason um, you need to sail the boat a little bit closer to the wind, and if you try sailing the boat closer to the wind, the hull just comes out of the water in a kind of like we might capsize kind of way, then what you can do, it's not very nice, but you can do it, is you can just ease the traveller out a bit. And what that will do is slow the boat down a little bit, and that might allow you to point up towards the wind more. But the bottom line is, when it's windy, the, the mainsail is actually in as tight or tighter than when you're going upwind, when you're going downwind. So there you go. Thank you very much for your question there, Nick. Very good. All right, we've got Dan on board. Great to have you with us, Dan. Good, glad you could make it. All right, Willis with a little follow-up on the plastic screw. He's trying to avoid drilling it out. I was told you can do it from the top. If you hear anything about that, let me know. Certainly will. Yeah, you could you could load this from the top, but if your screw is seized up, there is no, is mm, you might be able to do it. If you put all of your gear in, Mm, yeah, um, it's going to be tricky. That is the bottom line there. Put the gear in, put the cam in, really push it down, and then put a screwdriver through the middle of the cam to hold it in position so then you can get the pin in. That's what I'd look at. Okay, we've got Seafront Gamer there. Hello, Charlie. Um how is Harry? Yeah, Harry's doing well. He's, I think he's gone home already today. It was actually the last day of Kids Club today here at Wildwind Sailing Holidays. So there was a little bonus session. There is one. That's Matt. It's his last day at work. Um, it's Matt from Ireland. He's been doing a great job. Um, what do you need? Just a tiny little screw. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Matt's last day at work. Uh, last day of Kids Club. It's a turning sort of period of the season now at Wildwind Sailing Holidays. Thanks for tuning in there, Charlie. All right, we've got Gerables. I was in Vasiliki for six weeks. Now I'm back at my house. I hope uh, everything is all right back at your house. Try to work out who that is. Hmm. I'm sure I would know. All right, anyway. All right, we've got Russell on board. Hello, Russell. I've always been on, I've always been the skipper. This weekend, I'm crewing on a NACRA 20 for a long distance race, trying to decide if I want to control the main sheet or the downhaul thoughts. Yeah, um, what I would opt for is if the wind is at a strength where playing the downhaul is having a decent effect. So if it's kind of like trapezable or double trapezable, um, but not full power, then playing the downhaul can really have a big effect. Uh, definitely on a 20, a big boat like that. Um, much more efficient way of, of uh, controlling the power is with the downhaul and really crank that bad boy. So as you go into the gust, wind it on and you really feel the boat accelerate. And then before you come out of the gust, ease it off um, to put more curve into the sail. So if you're going into a lull, you're going into the lull with maximum power. Very nice indeed. Um, and just continue like that. But if the wind is getting such that you're sailing with the downhaul on full, then at that time, that's when you want to grab the main sheet Helmsman takes the travel line and then you're just working the main sheet once the wind gets that strong. That's what I would say. All right, we've got Zach here. He's on a break at work for a bit. Great that you could tune in for a bit there, Zach. 
and Bull Thrush is on board as well. Hello, Bull Thrush. Thanks for coming. All right. So I think we're going to move on to our first preloaded question. All right. If I can find it. Hold on. Where did I put it? Oh, my word. All right. Just looking for. OK, this is from Jazz, who says, does the age of the boat matter when you're getting into the sport? He's got a 1991 16 foot cat. But where he sails, there's a lot of new cats and more powerful boats like tornadoes. I'm thinking that I won't stand a chance in racing. OK, so before we go on to the age of the boat, we could just talk a little bit about racing different types of boats against each other. So let's say there are, of course, many, many different types of catamaran, which is talking about catamarans, of course. Um, so just to generalise, we've got at the fastest end, we're talking non-foiling, by the way, we've got the Tornado. And then the next step up would be the F-18. Close behind the F-18, we'd have the F-16, which actually does better a lot of the time around the course than the F-18. And then after that, what would we have? Then probably there's a bit of a gap there, but maybe then you'd have something like... Um, a six, uh, 16 foot boat with a spinnaker like um, uh, Hobie 16 with a spinnaker or a, a Prindle 16 with a spinnaker, something like that. The NACRA 500 with the Mark II, I think. Um, and then after that would come the Hobie 16, the Dart 18. And then, of course, after that, we'd be moving down to like the Hobie 14, Dart 15, Prindle 15. And the list would go on. There's, of course, a lot of other boats that would fill in the gaps in that list. And then all the boats on the, that are racing, they have what's called a yardstick, a handicap number. So the faster the boat is the more it would have to beat the slower boat over a course. And um, we've um, here in Vasiliki at Wildwind, we've actually developed our own yard skip, yardstick system here, which works for the conditions that we're getting here. So for example, the Tornado, we sail off a yardstick of 74, F-18, 76 then we don't have all this so then the next one would be Hobie 16 85 so what that means is the tornado would have to beat the Hobie 16 um by 11 percent So 11%, which means 11 minutes in a 100-minute race. Or we could cut that in half, of course. So if it was a 50-minute race, the Tornado would have to beat the 16 by five and a half minutes. And, of course, we could then chop that in half if it's a shorter race. So these handicap numbers are to basically mean that even though you're sailing a 16-foot cat, you can race against Tornadoes and beat them but what you have to do is it is a difficult way of racing because you don't really know how you're doing until after the race unless you sit uh, maybe it's coming up to 50 minutes and you see a boat in front of you go around the mark you could start your watch and time how long it takes you to then get to that mark and then you could get some sort of idea about how you are on the corrected time 
that would be um, quite a good way of looking at it. So there you go. That is how we can sail different boats against other boats. Of course, some of the boats are going to perform generally better in different wind strengths, like the Hobie 16 or the Dart 18 is going to perform much better when the wind is really strong. Uh, the Tornado, for its yardstick number, is going to perform much better in lighter wind strengths, um, where it will do much better around the course. The other advantage the faster boats have is after the or on the start line and round the course, they're just going to be able to get away from the other boats, have clean wind and not be affected by the other boats. Whereas if you're in one of the slower boats that's racing, it is going to be more difficult to find space, clean wind and all that on the race course. So there are some considerations. Then with the age of the boat, yes, an older boat is less likely to be as quick as a brand new boat. But if you're new to the sport, you shouldn't let that worry you. Um, what you could do is as you get better, perhaps there's other people in your club who might be replacing their sails. So the first thing to get your boat going faster to replace would be the sails. The jib will wear out a lot quicker than the mainsail. So look at replacing the jib first, then the mainsail. Um, this is talking about going faster. Let's assume we're all, we've already replaced the rigging so the mast isn't going to fall down. And make sure, of course, your boat is set up as well as it can be. And then you don't you won't necessarily be too far behind the newer boats. So there we go, Jess. I hope that helps with your question. Uh, thank you very much. OK, so at this time we're at 37 minutes. I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Mm. Water tastes so much better out of a bottle that says Joyrider TV on it. You can get these at totaljoyrider.com. Thank you very much. All right. So moving on. Um, we've got uh, Willis. He's still on board. He says, on a side note, if I'm anchoring to scuba dive and leaving the boat unattended, would you recommend dropping the main while I'm gone or just leave it up. Yeah, wow. That is pretty cool. Using the boat to get out to go scuba diving. Um, I haven't heard of many people doing that. So I think you might even be a bit of a pioneer there, Willis. So great job there. I would just consider how long are you going to be leaving the boat for? I take it you're going to be leaving it completely unattended. Um, if you're going to be leaving it for like half an hour or so, and when you're getting off the boat, it looks completely flat calm. The forecast is very settled, very consistent, and there's no sign of any wind on the horizon. Then you could leave the main sail up. Uh, maybe the nature of where you're, anchoring as well that is something to take into consideration if um it's a really good uh place for anchoring like a uh, sand or mud bottom where the anchor can really grab in nicely then perhaps you you can anchor with the mainsail up in more wind whereas if the bottom the seabed isn't quite as good um like if it's rocky or something um then perhaps dropping the main would be a better idea. But uh, it really depends on how much wind is there, how long you're going to leave the boat for. I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving a boat for more than, say, 25, 30 minutes with the mainsail up if there was nobody to keep an eye on it. That's what I would say. Good question. OK, Bullthrush says, did you watch the Fastnet race? No, unfortunately, I I didn't. Um, it's just been absolutely flat out here on the Wild Wind Beach. Um, we've actually been full now for a couple of weeks. Well, since the start of August, we've been absolutely full. 
next week we're full as well. We're just full, uh, which means we've got quite a lot on. But I am trying to find time to keep some videos coming. Um, I don't know if you saw, but I did actually um, go out sailing on a laser the other day, which was fun, um, as you will have seen in the video. Um, yeah, but we have been full, so not much time for watching stuff. All right, I've got Lee. Hello, Lee. My question is a simple one. I'm restoring 1982 Hobie 18, focused on rigging and ropes right now. Nice. My cat has two shock cords fore and aft on the outer edge, pardon, of each hull. All right. The Hobie 18 handbook doesn't explain their intended use. And I correct to assume these shock cords are for the trapeze. That is Lee in Lake Tobskovki, Ma Masson. Is that Georgia? I'm, I'm the key. I'm really good at bad pronunciation of places, by the way. Yeah, I would say that is certainly going to be for the trapezes. It's been a very long time since we had any Hobie 18s here. But um, what I seem to remember from when we used to have Hobie 18s here, I think, um, am I making this up or is this true? You'd have a small hole, two small holes in the gunnel, and then the shock cord for the trapeze, the elastic, would go in there. And then under the gunnel, the front one would go all the way to the bow and tie off there. And then the back one would go all the way in to the transom to the back and tie off there. Does that seem familiar or... Am I making that up? That's definitely what's on the Dragoon. All right. But um, yes, those would be for the uh, shock cord. Very good. For the trapeze, sorry. Oh, we've got Tim, Clearwater, Florida. Hope you got back all right there, Tim. All right. Robin says, I have three boats worth of rudders and they're all seized, but I've never had a problem swapping the cams from the top. Yeah. Um, it's just you won't be able to adjust them. That is the issue. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time I will replace cams without um, the actual cam. You are, of course, always going to be replacing from the top. So should, should we do it? Should we put one in? All right. Here we go. All right. Just getting some bits. Gonna need one of these. Okay, and all right, I am coming back. Just looking for parts. All right. So, just want the right cam pin. There he is. All right, and then we just need a cam. And then we're off to the races. All right. Okay. So one thing, if you ever um, find that your rudders won't lock down correctly, do take a look at your cam. And sometimes the cam will a lot of the time look really worn like here. Maybe this bit will be bent or mangled. But one part that gets overlooked is the hole in the middle. And if the hole in the middle is elongated or it's worn out, then the cam is able to move forwards and backwards, which means it isn't going to lock the rudder down correctly. Um, all right. And then so once we've got our cam with a good hole in it, we take the cam pin. I know in the States. You guys sometimes have a different system, but this is what we have in Europe. It's not as good, to be honest. Um, we'll put that in. And then we just want to make sure that the cam does rotate nicely on the pin like that. So it's not catching. Oh, there we go. Masson is pronounced Macon. 
All right. All right. So then what I would generally do for replacing the cam is I would generally unscrew the screw to about halfway or a bit more. But so it's not risking coming out completely. And then this is where the fun starts. We'll take the cam. We're going to put it in in the inverted position. So like this. Locate that curved part onto the plunger like that and then with the palm of the hand going to push down lining the hole the holes up and then we can pop through our special screwdriver with the end cut off and then from there i would generally rest this on something solid you can of course do this on the boat as well but I would always prefer to do this off the boat because you are going to have to hit it with a hammer to get the pin in. And if you do that with it on the boat, it's just going to put some shock through everything, like through the rudder pin, through the bushings, through the gudgeons, and then through the screws where the gudgeons go into the hulls. So better if you do take it off the boat to replace the cams. and then. We're going to put that on something solid and then pull this just so it's flush with the end like that and get the pin in there like that and then tappy tappy with a little hammer to get it in. There we go. And then once it's in, we can then flip it into the correct position. So let's just kind of pretend that that's the pin in there. So I can't do that just now like that and then we're good to go now with the screw as a good starting point i usually go for the screw flush with the casting that seems to be a good starting point but it really will depend on the age of your equipment how sort of worn the spring is in there if the spring's gone a bit softer which I don't think that happens very much, but it could do. Then you're going to want to wind it in a little bit more. So there we go. That is how I would go about it. If you're ever taking the cam out, what we would have done is knocked this in. When you take the cam out, put your hand over the top, because otherwise the pressure in the spring just shoots everything and you can lose your parts. So there we go. That's That's what I would do there. All right, Robin says, I usually just force it down by hand till I could get a screwdriver for it. Yes, exactly. That pin you're using is what I have sister screws for. Yeah, I think it's those screws that maybe I need to get hold of. Do they, I take it those are screws that kind of screw into the end of this to hold it in. That would be really handy to have. Because another thing we have, uh, you'll notice this says cam pin hole too big, um, which means that hole is too big. So it moves slightly in there. So what we want is to have some way of keeping that in there. There we go. OK, so. There we are, I think. Has anybody got any more questions? Because otherwise we have run out of questions can you believe no more preloaded questions this week it's been pretty quiet on the preloaded question front hope everybody's been having some good sailing or at least having a good time um yeah thanks very much for watching and for all of your support and everything and um do keep an eye out tomorrow at the usual time this time tomorrow uh, there'll be the new video with the 360, the 360 cam, the GoPro Max on the helmet. The footage is absolutely stunning. Check it out on Instagram. I'll just put a screenshot on there if you want to see that. Um, get a sneak preview. All right. All right. We've got Didums55 says, can you go over? Mast rake, what happens if you move it forwards and backwards? Yes, we can. All right, let's have a look. 
All right. So this is actually the same for all boats, except on some boats, it's a little bit more kind of precise than other boats. There we go. So before we look at mast, is this the front? Yes. All right. So what we have on the boat is we have what we would call the center of lateral resistance. So on a boat like an F-18 or a daggerboard, um, any daggerboard or centerboard boat, the center of lateral resistance is going to be the centerboard or daggerboard. So we could even mark that here as well. If it's a boat that has skeg hulls, so let's put him here, slightly smaller scale, like a Dart 18. Then the center of lateral resistance is gonna be in a sort of similar spot, but it's gonna be a lot more ambiguous because it's like, all of that is doing the job of the center board. So the center of lateral resistance is going to be sort of fairly similar um, about there. And then if we've got a boat with asymmetric hulls, <coughs> then we've got pretty much the whole length of the hull that sits in the water doing the job of the centerboard. So then it gets even more ambiguous where the center of um, center of lateral resistance is. But on most boats, it would be sort of near to where the shroud anchor point is, maybe a little bit further back um, on these boats. So that's the center of lateral resistance. So with the mast rake, if we start off with it back and then we'll come forwards. So if we're putting the mast rake back, what that is doing is it's bringing the sail and what we have in the rig is what's called the center of effort. center of effort um we're bringing the center of effort further back by bringing the mast further back so hold on we're going to draw another boat let's go crazy with the drawings here so um so there's the center of lateral resistance this okay i think we're doing well here this is the center of effort um if we bring the center of effort further back from the center of lateral resistance what that is going to do is it's the center of lateral resistance we could also look at as it being the pivot point on the hull so where the boat is going to pivot so if we apply pressure behind the pivot point, what that's going to do is encourage the boat to turn into the wind. It's in the same, it's the same thing that we're doing when we're going for attack. We're sheeting the mainsail in, which is putting more pressure behind the pivot point, bringing the front of the boat up into the wind. But if we've got the mast further back, generally, the further back we go, the more the boat is going to want to head up into the wind because we're bringing the center of effort a lot further back from the center of lateral resistance. So what we're aiming for is to find the sweet spot of lining up the center of effort with the center of lateral resistance. And what we want is the center of effort to be, um, let's go for a new picture. We're going for a new picture. All right. We want the center of effort 
just a little bit further back than the center of lateral resistance. So here we go. We're drawing a bigger boat. There's the boat. Center of lateral resistance is going to be black, lovely. And center of effort, we're just going to draw it with a green circle. I think that's fair. So what we want is it just a little bit further back. And what that's going to do is mean if you let go of the tiller extension, if you stop steering, then the boat is going to head up slightly. So there'll just be the slightest pull while you're going along on the rudders um, and the boat is naturally going to want to turn up into the wind. So that is what we're looking for. Um, as the wind gets stronger, we're more likely to be trimming the boat further back, standing further back on the boat, which means we can then put the mast further back also because our centre of lateral resistance is going to be moving further back as well because we're putting more hull in the water all the way along and not so much just at the front. So, and then, but we never want, so this is a good point. We never want to have that center of lateral resistance much further forwards than the center of effort. The only time we do want to do that is if we're sailing something like a Hobie 16 downwind in really light winds, then it's really going to help to pull the boat. But other than that, what putting that further forwards is going to do. So if that was there, the boat is going to want to turn downwind all the time, which means if you fall off the boat, the boat is just going to keep going and go faster and faster and never stop until it hits land. So there we go. Um, Didham's 55. That was a quick explanation on mast rake. Uh, thanks very much to everybody. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Tim, my jib battens hang up on the mast while tacking in medium air. Should I trim them a little bit? Yeah, if you've got plenty. I would just be wary trimming your battens because once you've trimmed them, it's a one way road. You can't put that bit back on. Um, just really check. Make sure. I would always go for in the jib uh, on a 16. Make sure you've got a decent amount of tension in those battens. Um, I would just say. And if you've got a decent amount of tension in the battens and you've still got a decent amount sticking out of the back, if you've got this type of battens that tie in, you, you of course need to have enough batten to make sure you can have them tied in. But um, if you've got that already, then yeah, by all means, trim a bit off. But uh, I think someone once said, measure twice, cut once, because you can't put it back. Not factory battens, right, gotcha. Okay. Okay, we've got Kai Mayer Ricks on board. Hi Kai, great to have you with us. Greetings to Berlin from Vasiliki. Hopefully we'll be seeing you in the next couple of weeks. Eric. Always enjoy the live chats. Send the beans. I'll put them in the post. Hopefully they'll be fresh by the time they get there. Hello, Charlie. How is Harry? Oh, we went over this earlier. Harry's fine, but Kids Club is uh, is over. Sad time. All right, we've got all from Canmore. What is the max weight limits of a Hobie 16? Okay, this really does depend on what you are wanting to do with your 16. Um, or actually, it depends on if you want to race the 16 and be competitive. I would say that you can probably you can probably put like 240 kilos on a 16 and you're not going to damage the boat. But of course, the more often you sail with a lot of weight on the 16, the boat is going to feel... Um, what, what's it going to feel? It's going to be taking a lot more strain than it would be if you're sailing with less weight on the boat. Um, like if you're putting 240 kilos out on the trapeze, 
that is a massive amount of strain that the boat is taking. All of the boat, the mast, the rigging, the trapeze wires, and let's not overlook the leeward hull. So, um, I think we did something similar a couple of weeks ago, actually. With so there we are out on the trapeze. It's not my best drawing, but um, so the more weight you put out here. It's just putting more pressure down through the whole lot. And this side of the hull is taking all of it and the rudder and everything that fixes the rudder to the hull. That side of the hull and the rudder is going to be taking all of that pressure. So the more often you sail the boat with a lot of weight on it in a lot of wind, it is going to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate the degradation of your materials, but she can take it, but it is gonna accelerate the degradation of the materials. Thanks very much for the question. If you wanted to race, then I think about 130 kilos is the sweet spot. So um, for me, I'm 90 kilos, uh, means I'd need to sail with a 40 kilo crew. There you go, that's some maths. All right, Didham's 55. Brill, thanks for the input. I was getting a large about amount of weather helm on the Dart 18 at Bridlington before my shroud snapped. Ooh, nasty. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. All right, so if you've got weather helm, if it, the rudders are getting really heavy, first thing to do is when you get back to the beach, uh, of course, if your mask just fallen down, sort that out first. But when you get back to the beach, check your rudders first and just check that they're locking down correctly. Because if the rudders are not locking down correctly, so how should we draw this? Um, what does that look like? So it's like that. That is the rudder stock then the rudder blade would be like that. So if it is locking down correctly, it means when you put pressure here, there's no space appearing here. Yeah, does that make sense? All right, if there's space appearing here, it means the rudder blade is going to be coming further back. As the rudder blade comes further back, it's going to make your steering more heavy. So anything that's a little bit out, it's going to be heavy anyway. But if your mast's back a little bit too far, it's re you're really, really going to feel it. But with uh, weather helm, you can also just try experimenting with where your crew is, where all of your weight is positioned on the boat. Try moving forwards a bit, see how that feels on the rudders. Try moving backwards a bit, see how that feels. There we go. Greetings from New Zealand. How's it all? That must be rather late at night there, Cratch Cratch. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Willis says, I always say measure five times, cut three times. Easy to remove, but impossible to put it back. All right. And we've got Alessandro. Is it possible to hoist Hobie 16 sails in deep water? Okay, next video coming up. We're going to be hoisting 16 sails afloat with heavy wind. Okay, I'm going to try, I have to try to wrap this up fairly soon. So if you ease back. Uh, all right, Willis, I forgot to ask. I've got an adjustable tiller end cap. Adjustable tiller end cap. Okay because it was the same price as the original. Can't find anything on curting, converting the old system. Should I cut a bit off the crossbar? Okay, if you, all right, let's get some more bits to look at. Okay, so. All right, if you're talking about this sort of thing, like this 
so you've just got one like this, I would say don't cut anything because once again, like we said, measure five times, cut three times. Um, don't cut anything first. Take the old piece out, fit the new piece, then put it on the boat, measure the alignment of the rudders, and then take it from there. Um, yeah, so don't cut anything. Put put it on first. You don't have to put the screws in. Just put it. It's the older one with the screw and the hex nut. Yeah, same thing. Um, put it in. Don't cut anything. And see if at its narrowest what the rudder alignment is like. Of course, when looking at the rudder alignment, um, make sure your jib is up first. Because if the jib's not up, the rudder alignment won't be accurate. Having the jib up means it's going to pull the bows of the boat in a little bit, which is going to influence your rudders. If you want to know more about the rudder alignment, just check out the video on rudder alignment. There we go. All right. All right. So all, fro, all from Canmore says max weight not to race, but good speed, 30, 25 to 30 kilometers. What signs should you look for in degradation? I would just, just look for soft parts on the hull. Check the sides of the hull. Check the deck, that kind of thing. Also, your rudders are going to go out a little bit more, a little bit more quickly if you're sailing in heavy winds with a lot of weight um, because of the extra pressure. So uh, you'll need to service. If you want to keep your rudders absolutely sweet, you're going to have to service them a little bit more often if you're sailing either with more wind more regularly or more weight and more wind. The more load you're putting through everything, the more often you'll have to service your rudders if you want to keep them sweet. All right. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up here. I've got things to do, people to see and what have you. Thanks very much for everybody's involvement this afternoon. Um, and I'll see you soon with some more. Um, and don't forget, tomorrow, same time, the 360 camera on the helmet, on the 16. Very nice. Just a quick one for Mike there. Who makes the best trapeze harnesses? Any you know that give good back support? I would say Magic Marine. That is the short answer to that. Okay, so there we go. On that note, I'll get all this indexed uh, tomorrow. And so then if you do want to watch this later and find where the different questions were addressed, that will be in the description. If you get this far, you'll have already seen it. So don't know why I'm saying it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right.